Though we are free from all men, we choose to choose to be slaves again. Do it all possible, as many as possible, for Jesus Christ as one. Live by the cross to every man on Jesus, Jesus' word. Take a stand to win all possible, as many as possible, for Jesus Christ as one. Every nation is bleeding, crying out for an answer. Men of courage must rise up again. Where are the mighty men? The kingdom now is at hand, and so we must become slaves again. To win all possible, as many as possible, for Jesus Christ, the Lord of Lord, the King, King of Kings, Kings has Kings. won. Jesus Christ, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, Christ our Lord has won. When Jesus gathered the twelve disciples, to share the Passover meal once more. Remember breaking the bread. Remember wine flowing red. This is a sign of a brand new promise. I will be poured out to set you free. Remember do this for me. died and took my place. Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope that has set you free. Until we're standing face to face. Remember, remember me. When Peter said he would not deny him, you know I'm ready to die with you. Remember three times tonight. Remember you will deny. Then after Jesus had been arrested, Peter denied him for the third time. Remember the Lord looked at him. died and took my place. Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope that has set you free until we're standing face to face. Remember, remember me. When Jesus saw the adulterous woman and he was asked if she should be stoned, Remember, you made not a sound. Remember, you rode on the ground. He said, The one without sin among you shall be the one to throw the first stone. Remember, all walked away. Remember, go sin no more. Remember, Remember me. that is for my. forget the grace when Jesus died and took my place. Remember the sin that no longer haunts you. Remember the hope 
that has set you free until we're standing face to face. Remember, remember me. Good morning and welcome to Valley Christian. Uh, we are an imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. That is what we believe and we're so grateful that God knows everything about us and he still loves us. And I want to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service online. And I pray that this time can draw you closer to God as well as closer to others. I want to let you know that this is a sermonian and most of our services will be Sir Munion online, but it's a special one because in person we're doing an all worship service. And so this Sir Munion is going to be kind of in line with that. I'm not going to be doing any singing, but I will be talking about worship. And I just want to let the members know that as many of you guys know, uh, in October, my sister passed away. And recently, just a couple of weeks ago, my mother passed away. And um, it's been a kind of a hard time for our family. And I, myself and Nadine, we will be taking um, a hiatus, so to speak, or time off for at least the next two weeks. And so we're going to not be doing any kind of ministry responsibilities. And we're going to just spend some time connecting with each other, connecting with God, uh, grieving and mourning and just taking some time away from work. So we desire your prayers during this time, but we have a wonderful staff that can handle all your questions and all your issues. Just please contact them during this time. And also just want to thank everyone for their love, support, and prayers through this difficult time in our family's lives. So let's go to God in a word of prayer, and we'll get started with our sermon. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, grateful for your mercy, grateful for your love, grateful for all the ways that you work and you move. And Father, we're grateful for the ways that you provide for us, Lord. And truly the boundary lines have fallen in pleasant places. Though we go through struggles and through, though we go through trials, you are faithful, God, and you faithfully take us through these trials and help us to become more and more like Christ in the midst. Father, we're just grateful for all that you do. Be with us as we talk about worship and truly help us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Forgive us for where we fall short. Forgive us where we go astray, Lord, and help us and direct us that we might bring you glory with the lives that we live. We love you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about worship. Um, and the awesome thing about worship is you could pretty much do it anywhere. And God loves worship. He loves glory, and he's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our glory, uh, worthy of all glory. And I pray that we don't just relegate worship to singing on Sundays, but we're going to look at worship and how it's actually our entire lives. And so we'll start, and the title of the lesson is Worship the Lord. We're going to start in Psalm 100, verse 1 through 5. Because this is one of those psalms that really speaks to how we are to worship God and, and even why we worship God. In Psalm 100, verse 1 through 5, says, Shout forth joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Those last, that last line in verse five alone is worthy of having us worship God all the time. For the Lord is good. God is good. And his love endures forever. 
It endures when we fail. It endures when we sin. It endures when we go astray. It endures in good times and in bad times. And that is why God deserves our worship, because he has lavished us as his children with love. And it says his faithfulness continues through all generations. And we know that throughout all generations, people have been faithful and unfaithful, have been good and have been evil, been righteous and unrighteous. And yet God is faithful. His faithfulness does not depend on us. He is holy and entirely different from us. He is not human like us that he should lie. He's not human like us that he should fail. He is faithful. And that is why we worship God. And that's why if we worship anything else or anyone else, it's idolatry because they fall far short, far, far below God, who is almighty. And so Psalm 100, verse 1 through 5, really sets the tenor on how we are to worship. We're supposed to worship with joy. We're supposed to worship with singing, with gladness, with thanksgiving, with praise, with all these things going on in our hearts and in our minds. And yes, even when we're down, even when we're going through tough times, we can be joyful and thankful to God and worship Him. And so I want us to understand that Worship is is integral in our relationship with God. It is it is foundational in our relationship with God. When we look at the patriarchs, when we look at the apostles and the and, and the the prophets, when we read throughout the scriptures, we see praise, we see worship, we see adoration, we see thanksgiving all the time, because God is worthy of all of that from us all the time, and so we worship God in joy because we're loved by him. Again, foundational. And the other foundational teaching is that God loves us and his love endures forever. And so join me in this small brief journey of of studying out worship and and why we worship. If we go to John chapter 4, verse 19 through 24, this is towards the tail end of Jesus's discussion with the Samaritan woman at the well. And they have this discussion and, and, and each Uh, response or question, Jesus gets a little bit deeper uh, into the woman's life, into spiritual things. And in verse 19, in the middle of this conversation, the woman said, sir, I can see that you are a prophet. So it started out with a stranger. uh, And now it's gotten to the point where she sees that he's a prophet. And later on, Jesus is going to reveal that he's the Messiah. Verse 20, our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers a father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. And I love this exchange because it reveals to us later on, and those that would exist in the future, that there is no sacred place. There's no journey we're to go to so that we could truly worship God. Worshiping God does not take place in a building only, take place in a certain location, take place in a holy city only. It is done in spirit and in truth. Why? Because God is spirit. So God is not limited by location. He's not limited by temples. He's not limited by uh, holy places. We can worship God anywhere at any time as long as we're worshiping in the spirit and in truth. So you see, the Samaritans had set up a false uh, idol and a false temple, if you will, at Bethel, because when the kingdom split, Jeroboam was afraid that people would give their loyalty back to the tribe of Judah and Benjamin if they were to travel to Jerusalem to worship God there. So they set up their own temple, they set up their own priesthood, and it was all evil idolatry. It was all false. And, the, and so Israel, the northern kingdom, basically fell into idolatry eventually in 1722, were taken over by the Assyrians. But those that existed, the, the those that were replanted after 
uh, 22 BC. They 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 are the Samaritans or the they're the Jews of impure bloodline because they were mixed with non-Jews, and they maintain this separation from the the Jews. And so they said, or Jesus said, you worship what you don't understand. You you worship what you don't know, because they again were separated from true worship when the kingdom split. And he says that the Jews, they worship what they do know. But the problem is, as we read in the Gospels, they weren't worshiping in the spirit and they weren't worshiping in truth. The biggest reason why they weren't worshiping in the spirit and in in truth was because they were rejecting who Jesus was. He came in all grace, in all truth, in the spirit God gave when Jesus um, died, rose again and ascended into heaven. He gave the spirit. And so we see in Acts 2 going forward, true worshipers worshiping in spirit and in truth. It doesn't mean that those beforehand didn't worship God, but it they didn't worship in the way that 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 God desires, not in ritual, not in formalities, not in just religion. He wanted people to worship from the heart in spirit and in truth. And today we get that privilege of worshiping in spirit and in truth. Why? Because those who are followers of God are filled with his spirit. Those who are followers of Jesus follow Jesus in truth because he was the bearer of truth and grace. And so we get to worship God. So we worship God in spirit and in truth. We don't worship a false God. We don't worship in in, in, in false doctrine. We don't worship in, in false teachings. We, we have the scriptures. We have the Holy Spirit. They work in unison to create the picture of God, the, the true picture of God and who we worship. And so it's super important to understand that when we worship God, to worship him the way he desires to be worshiped is in spirit and in truth. But it's not, like I said, limited to a location, and it's not limited to just singing. It's not limited to just hand raising. We worship God with our lives. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So Paul spent 11 chapters talking about God's mercy, his sacrifice, his resurrection, uh, the covenant of faith, all these things. And so he says, in view of God's mercy, in view of the fact that we can be saved because of what Jesus did on the cross, he says, I urge you to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So he says, you, your bodies together as one sacrifice, communal working as the body of Christ, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So worship comes in when, when we as a community come together as one and we live to the glory of God, but even as each individual does the same thing, worships God. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Don't get us wrong. We were created to worship. And that's why we see so many people worshiping so many different things. That's why we see so many different religions. We were created to worship, but we were created to worship God. And anything other than worshiping God is a perversion of why we were created. And so I want us to see this. He says, live our, our, or our bodies are living sacrifices. That's, that's our holy and pleasing to God. This is our true and proper worship. Our lives are worship. In Colossians, it says, do everything as unto the Lord, because we know that it's from him that we will receive our inheritance. It's from him we will receive our reward. So we need to understand everything we do is an act of worship. There's a book by Brother Lawrence, I believe, called The Presence of God, where he says, man, washing the dishes is an act of worship. Dusting is an act of worship. Picking up dog poo is an act of worship. Whatever we do. Our entire lives is an act of worship of God. If we walk with the reality, if we live with the reality that he is always with us and we are always with him. And so it says here that when we do this, we'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. Now you say, can I worship God even in sin? No, because that's not his good, pleasing and perfect will. It says that when we live as pleasing and holy to God, that is our proper worship. 
So if we're living impure, unrighteous, ungodly lives, and we come to church on Sunday and we raise our hands, hey, we're just fooling ourselves. We need to worship God with our lives. That means whether we're in church, outside of church, being seen, not being seen, people looking, people not looking, we are to worship God. So we worship God with our lives. And so let me ask the question, is everything in your life centered around the worship of God? That is our true and proper act of worship. Now, that doesn't mean you're going around with your hands lifted high everywhere you go or singing everywhere you go, although we are called to pray always. But at the same time, it's living in the presence and the reality that, that we live in the presence of God. God is spirit. That means he's not limited by physical location. He is everywhere and he is in us. And therefore, we live our lives as living sacrifices because we worship God with their entire lives. And we worship God in reverence and in awe. So we already talked about the fact that God is love and we should worship him in joy. We, we talked about spirit and truth. And we talked about our whole lives are living sacrifices for him. But there's this concept introduced in the book of Hebrews where God is not to be seen as uh you know, just like us. There is to be reverence. There is to be awe. There is to be wonder. There is to be respect. There is to be a fearful understanding that God is the Lord Almighty. So in Hebrews chapter 12, the, the author of Hebrews is relating to Jews, uh, predominantly Jewish believers, about what they've stumbled upon or what they've been called into as disciples of Jesus. In verse 18, it says, you have not come to a mountain that cannot be, that can, that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. So he's calling them back to Mount Sinai when God first spoke through Moses to the people after the Exodus. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I'm trembling with fear. He says, that's not what you've come to. That's not, that's not the God that you have come to in this kingdom of God in verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. So again, spirit and in truth. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angel in joyful assembly to the church of the firstborn whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirit, spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks, talking about the preachers that come preach the truth. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? So he's not talking just about preachers, but he's talking about even the message that Jesus brought. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing of what can be shaken. That is created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, a heavenly kingdom, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Sometimes when we get fixated on what's just around us, the, the pain, the suffering, the death, the wars, just the problems, God can in one sense, lose his shine. God can, in our minds, sometimes be tarnished. Is he sovereign? Does he really know what's going on? Is he really in control? Is he really all powerful? If we're not careful, when we see the created things in, in, the, in God's creation, in, in, in disarray, we attribute that, well, maybe God is in disarray, or maybe God's not as powerful. And he's saying, no. We need to understand that the things that we see and touch and stuff, like that, that stuff can be shaken. But we're a part of a kingdom, a heavenly kingdom that cannot be shaken. 
because it's founded on God. It's founded by God. It's ruled by God. And it says that we need to worship him with reverence and awe. That is the acceptable way to worship God. Why? He stands outside of all this junk and yet stoops down inside to help us, to strengthen us. He stoops down to make us great. He stoops down to lift us up. This, what we see is not God. What we don't get to see is the heavenly God, right? God face to face. And one day, Lord willing, we will see him face to face. But it starts now by faith, understanding that God is a consuming fire, understanding that God is almighty. And that's why we worship him. We worship God in reverence and in awe. But the last thing I I want to talk about as we go into communion is we worship God because Jesus did. Jesus, while on earth in human flesh, fully human and fully divine, worshiped God. And one of the most touching times and probably intimate times where we see this worship take place is in Matthew 26, verse 30. They had finished the sermon, uh, they had finished the Last Supper, they had finished eating together, taking the Passover meal. And it said that in verse 26, verse 30, it says, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what hymn that, that they sung, but or they sang, but what a... Uh, to me, I, I just see that one line and it's like, you know what? Jesus knew he was going to his death and he still took time to worship God in a hymn. He could have been like, man, I don't have time for this. Man, there's, there's, there's no time. I'm just not feeling it. I'm just not up to it. No, he concluded traditionally, it, the, the Passover meal concluded with a uh, Hallel or which is a, a really represents hallelujah, uh, uh, Psalms 113 to 118, uh, which is traditionally sung and and the the head of the household would sing a line and it would be followed by hallelujah. The Septuagint, uh, uh, hallel and yah is translated hallelujah, which is praise the Lord. And hopefully all that made sense. And so Jesus and his disciples, Jesus led his disciples in the worship of God, singing the Hallel. Um, and, and what's so amazing about this is Jesus was setting the example. Now think about this. Think about how important that time became after Jesus died and rose again from the dead. What were Paul and Silas doing in jail? They were singing. I mean, if you re- they were worshiping, if you really think about it, Jesus set for us an example, even in the midst of all suffering, we are to worship. And I want to close out this sermon, uh, Sermunion, reading Psalm 113. And I would encourage you to read 113 through 118. I'm not going to do that. But um, imagine reading this and after each line, someone saying hallelujah. So praise the Lord, which is translated hallelujah in in the Septuagint in Greek. So praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is, is exalted over all the nations, his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high, who stoops down to look on the heavens and on the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes, with the princes of his people. He settles the childless woman in her home as a happy mother of children. Praise the Lord. I pray that if we are so caught up in this world that it has begun to take away from our worship of God, take away from our reverence and awe of God, take away from the truth of God, or take away from the joy of God, I I pray that this sermon in some way and somehow can inspire us 
to worship God acceptably in spirit and in truth, in reverence and in awe with our entire lives, with joy and with thanksgiving, understanding that his love endures forever. Let us worship God even as we pray and close out this time before we take communion. Heavenly Father, we worship you, we praise you, we honor you, we lift you up because you are so amazing. Father, we are in awe of how amazing and how awesome, incredibly loving and merciful you are. You could wipe us off the face of this planet and start anew, and yet you don't do it because your son died for our sins. You love us, God. You have showered us with your love, and we're so grateful for all of that. Lord, as we take communion and remember His Jesus' body broken and his blood spilled for us, let us do so with reverence, awe, thanksgiving, and joy, and realizing, Lord, that we can't save ourselves, and realizing that you love us that much. Help us to praise your name. Hallelujah. God, we lift you up because you are worthy. Lord, we just ask that you be with us during this time, guiding us, leading us, and helping us to live life that brings you glory. God, we love you. We worship you. We praise you. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us online. We are so glad that you did. We'd like to invite you to continue your experience by joining a discussion and fellowship. All you have to do if you would like to join is click on the link in the description below the video. We hope that you really enjoy that. If you are not watching it live, we would like to invite you to get more information, to ask a question, or to maybe even join a Bible study 
by clicking on the link in the description below the video. Feel free to explore and get more information, but whatever you do, have a great week. God bless. Thank you for coming.